Beh, stiamo parlando ora di smart cities, continuiamo a parlare di questa parola, questa parola smart, smartphones, smart TVs, smart cities. Cosa vuol dire però veramente la parola smart e, e cosa vuol dire nella maniera in cui noi la usiamo? Beh, il nostro prossimo ospite parlerà di questo e anche un po' nella sua interpretazione, smart, che ovviamente non ve lo devo dire io, vuol dire intelligente, lui la unisce con la parola beauty, perciò smart è bellezza. E una delle cose che il nostro prossimo ospite ha creato, e per me è una cosa fantastica che vedrete nella sua presentazione, praticamente queste torri di 7 metri che si trovano a Pechino, che sono smoke free towers, praticamente queste torri, lui spiegherà bene, io ve lo spiego come filtro, ma non è proprio un filtro, però praticamente tira via eh, lo smog, che è un enorme problema in una città come Pechino, ma quasi tutte, tira via lo smog e, e le filtra. Perciò queste torri eh, per la città che non sono solo belle, ma sono utili. Perciò è mio grande piacere invitare a parlare di Landscape of the Future, artist and innovator e founder of Studio Rosegard, Dan Rosegard. Yeah. Yes. Grazie, Thanks. grazie. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's imagine a future city together, in which for me, beauty, eh, the beauty of a new city, is not about another Louis Vuitton bag or a Ferrari, but about clean air, clean water, and clean energy. And how can we use design and technology to improve this world around us? That's what I want to talk about today. Um, so we are a design firm based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, a dedicated team of designers, engineers, ar architects, project managers, basically with a mission to upgrade the world around us. And that's really important because the Netherlands, where I'm from, most of it is below sea level, yes? So without technology, without design, we would literally all die. Yes, <laughs> we would die a horrible death. So on the left, you have the sea, and on the right, you have Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, the other cities. So it's very interesting. If we wouldn't design our society, we would be flooded, eh? we would drown. But sometimes even the Dutch forget. And that's why we made Waterlicht, what you see here a combination of LEDs and lenses to show how high the water level would be because of climate change. And we started to flood these public spaces all around the world to create water awareness. Best wel spooky. <laughs> Spacey. Ja. Wat ik, het gevoel dat ik erbij krijg is een beetje onder water. Dat je onder een, een, een laag zit. Ja, best wel mooi, vind ik. With the waves above us. And it's, it's magnificent. Ik weet natuurlijk dat we beneden zeeniveau zitten, maar ja, zoals je het zegt, zou dat uh, niet zo fijn zijn als ik dit opeens over me heen ga voelen. Nee. Sixty thousand people, sixty thousand people showed up in one night, and some were a bit scared, eh? a bit frightened because they experienced floods in other countries. But most of them were more mesmerized. Can we generate energy from the changing in tide, or can we build floating cities eh? to be future-proof? So I think it's so important to think about design um, to create a collective experience where people are not just scared but more curious towards the future. And what is interesting of these kind of installations, eh? it's technology, 
but there's also the notion of poetry. It's the people, eh? the notion of wonder. That's really important, the notion of wonder, how we want our future city to look like. And we've done this in Paris, in London, in Amsterdam, in New York. Two weeks ago, we did it in Toronto, and something really special happened. Because when you give people space, eh? public space, physical space, but also mental space, people start to personalize it, to occupy it. So this happened. <laughs> people started to dress up as mermaids and would go there. This is not actor, eh? It's just somebody who came. I, I have no idea how she got there, actually. She sort of wiggled her way into it. Or a Daft Punk came to record their movie. So maybe the smart city, eh, the public smart city of today, is a space where you can experiment, where you can show, where you can perform, where you can learn. That is, I think, the true essence. And this week, if you're in the area, I don't know, but maybe, uh, we're showing it this Thursday and Friday in Dubai, and maybe next year in Italy. So the notion of design, technology, water, that's really important for me. Um, and as I said before, we live with the water, we fight with the water, being Dutch. These are the floodgates, the historical floodgates, which open and close the walls of, uh, uh, the walls of water to let the water in and out. If these fail, we die, yes? But they were in need of renovation. So the Minister of Infrastructure commissioned me can you make something to highlight this iconic, very important monument, eh? designed in 1932 by Dirk Roseburg, the grandfather of Rem Koolhaas, eh? famous Dutch architect. And we want to do something with light and energy and poetry, but we also realized that LEDs or cables or wires or microchips would die eh? because of the salt and the rain. So we wanted to make something sustainable. And then we were thinking, but of course there's already light present on this highway, which is the light of the... I'm not being rhetorical here. So <laughs> what kind of light is already there? The sun, yeah, very good. And what else? What is there also at, at nighttime? The moon, yeah, very good. <laughs> we're getting there. What else? The cars, yeah, very good. The headlights of the cars. That's interesting. What if we would upcycle that? So we took our Minister of Infrastructure, you see her on the right, she was really cool, and we started to mimic the headlights of the car and using them as an ingredient. So we renovated them, they look like temples again, 60 of them, this is daytime, and this is nighttime. So no battery, no cable, no energy bill, just a reflection of the headlights creates a landscape which is safe, and energy neutral. The light of your phone. These are the micro prismas we developed. So why do we have streetlights burning the whole night when nobody's there? Eh? That's not very smart. It consumes a lot of electricity and light pollution, which is bad for animals. And how, we can, how can we connect these very beautiful, traditional, historical elements and connect them more with future? Eh? I think it's about finding these new connections between something very practical and something very poetic. Um, so this is permanent out there, and it shows that you can be sustainable and still be very, very exciting. Or here, this is a very famous Van Gogh bicycle path. You know these glow-in-the-dark little stars that you had on the ceiling? Yes, when you were a boy or girl? Yes, yeah. I've been staring at them way too long when I was a five-year-old, I think. <laughs> that would explain a lot. But So they charge at daytime via the sun, and they glow at night. No battery. So five years ago, we went back to the lab 
And in order for the Van Gogh Foundation, who wanted to celebrate his 125th anniversary, we made a bicycle path in the area where Van Gogh lived and worked. How can infrastructure, eh? oh, thank you, thank you. Grazie. So how can infrastructure, eh, the roads, the highways, the pavement, the bicycle path, how can that be part of a smart city? We always talk about mobility and innovation about the car. Eh? The car can be sexy and glamorous and millions of euro research and development. We find that very normal. But what about the infrastructure? You know, why can't the pavement be an interface of information, of expression, of experiment? Yes, I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And all of these designs, don't get me wrong, it's not just about beautifying the world. I don't think it's about decorating it. I think it's about reforming it. And you know why that is really important? Because most of the time, the city is a machine that is trying to hurt us. Yes, that is trying to damage us. For example, here in China. Ugh. So this is a, a good day eh? <laughs> on the left and a bad day. Smog, air pollution. Also here in Milan, a cig if you are in a city which is heavily polluted, it's the same as 16 cigarettes per day that you inhale. Yes, without the pleasure of the nicotine. So <laughs> that's like a bad deal. We're not getting anything back. And so this is really weird that our desire for progress, eh, for innovation, for more, creates side effects which harm us. We live six to seven years shorter. Eh? Children have lung cancer when they're eight years old. Not good. So I was in China and I saw this from my room in Beijing and I became inspired by Beijing smog. It happens. And so, <laughs> and I remember being a boy when I was playing with this plastic balloon eh, at these this boring children parties when you polish a plastic balloon, it becomes... Again, I'm not being rhetorical here. <laughs> what, what happens when you polish a balloon? Yes, thank you. It becomes static electrified. It starts to attract your hair. You know this. So that's interesting. What if we would use that principle to build the largest smoke vacuum cleaner? Yes, we suck it up. We suck it up, we clean it, and then release it to make parks where people can breathe again. And one year later, we built the first one. So it sucks up 30,000 cubic meters per hour, eh? so it cleans like a soccer stadium within a day, capturing the PM2.5, PM10, the ultra-fine particles, and then releasing it so we have parks which are 20 to 70% more clean than the rest of the city. Here, true beauty is not a Louis Vuitton bag, but clean air. We did the scientific research uh, at the Technical University of Eindhoven to validate how it works using positive ionization, which uses very little energy and is very safe. And China started to call Poland, Mexico, Colombia, India, uh, the Netherlands. So all around, we are making these clean air parks. What's really interesting, I wanted to share this story with you, is this in uh, Krakow, in Poland. I was there, I arrived there at the day of the opening. Everything was finished. And you see the guy on the left, he's Nick, he's the project manager. So I arrived, everything looked good. And I walked there and suddenly the tower was surrounded with these little dogs. You see them here? And they were sort of hanging out, but there were like a lot of them. 
it was sort of this weird David Lynch movie I walked into, eh? this sort of secret meeting I wasn't invited for. And they looked really happy, so I asked the project manager, what are these dogs doing here? And he said, well, I don't know. Well, I said, let's find out. And we did. So, dogs, as you know, has a very high sense of smell, yes? So they suffer from smog even more, and they're very small, eh? so they, they cannot process it, and they suffer. And so what happened is that they could smell the clean air from far, far away. And they started to abandon their owner and hanging around the tower, you know? And they look really happy, you see? This one looks really happy, yeah. This, this one tries to be happy, but it's too small, yeah, so. <laughs> so this was not really the scientific data we were looking for. But it's interesting, if, if nature, if animals are very good in, in figuring out what is good or bad for them, why are humans not? And also we learn in a project like this, you have to be open, you have to be curious, you have to talk, you have to show, but you also have to have an open mind. This is Beijing smog. This is the stuff that we were sucking up from the urban skies. Ugh. Do not put this in your coffee. Eh? This is six years of your life. So if you live uh, next to a highway, this is inside of you, not good. And at the same time, we believe waste should not exist. Eh? Waste for the one should be food for the other. Think circular, like nature. Eh? Everything is a circle. So we put this under a microscope and realized that 42, 48% is carbon. And of course, we remembered that that's interesting because carbon under high pressure, you get Diamonds, yes, that's interesting. So inspired by that, we started to make smog-free rings, compressing it for 30 minutes. And so by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air to the city where the tower is in. I have one here. If the camera can zoom in a bit. Here, maybe you can show it around. Can you show it around for me, Massimo? Please. I can give it for myself. He said yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> and this is very interesting. We put it online, a Kickstarter campaign. And suddenly, people started to order it. And suddenly, people started to prepay it. So the finance we made with this jewelry, the finance we made with the rings, helped us to build the first tower, and the first smoke-free tower. So the waste isn't the waste, it's the activator, it's the enabler. But besides the money, because money is everywhere, what is interesting is community. This is crazy, yeah? Four, four weeks later, the wedding couples started to call us. And this is a true story, not actor. Eh? He proposes to her with the smoke-free ring eh? as a sign of true beauty, as a sign of, of hope. And um, we were really excited about this, so we called them. Oh, thank you. And <laughs> And what is really interesting is, so we called them. Ah, you can show it around in the audience, yeah. Yeah, well, you can show it around. Yeah, I want it back, please. But uh, I still have to get married one day, so. That's another topic. Anyway, <laughs> what is interesting is, so he proposed, um, and she said yes. <laughs> Look at the one there on the left top. So this is very powerful. Uh, Prince Charles has the cufflinks. So if we talk about a smart city, it's about design, it's about science, it's about technology, very important. Eh? It has to work, functional. But if it's disconnected, it's just a machine. We don't care. So we also need to make it personal. We need to make it shareable. And this combination of the personal, the private experience, and the collective, that creates impact. Finally, this is our new adventure. What are we looking at? Oh, I'm really curious if you know this one. What are we looking at? No? What is the, the, the center thing in the middle, the, the big bubble? That's Earth. This is space junk. 8.1 million kilo of space waste right now floating around the universe. In a way, it's the smog of the universe. It started in 1957, the launch of the Sputnik Apollo. Pieces of satellites and missiles started to break, eh, to collide, and created junk, waste. So apparently, we're not satisfied in, in polluting our planet Earth. We just keep on going outside our Earth atmosphere. That's a bit crazy. Yeah? 
And the weird part is, why, why should you care? Eh? Because it's like really far away. Well, if a tiny particle, because of its high speed, hits an existing satellite, satellite goes down. Eh? So no more GPS in the future, internet, no more Facebook, no more Instagram, no more WhatsApp. Eh? So although it is very far away, it is something very personal. It affects our communication. And ESA, the European Space Agency, is predicting that it's going to get worse. More satellites, more collisions, more particles, in such a way that in 25 to 30 years, we will have so many junk, like a layer around the Earth, that's called the Kessler effect, in such a way that we cannot launch more new missiles anymore. So basically, we're trapped. That is not the world I want to live in, yes? So we are on a mission for clean air, clean water, uh, clean air, but also clean space. So we just launched, this was two, three weeks ago, the Space Waste Lab. Phase one, visualizing. Phase two, capturing and upcycling it. Here we're showing real-time pieces of space waste above your head on 220,000 kilometers of height with these huge lines of light. Thousands of particles are floating around in the universe. It's space waste, caused by us. Broken pieces of satellites and missiles. If we keep on polluting with space waste like this, the planet Earth will be surrounded by this layer of junk. What can we do with it? Is it a problem or the ingredient for something new? So we're tracking 29,000 particles larger than 10 centimeters. We're pointing, we're visualizing, we're scanning. 8,000 people were there at the opening, and they were triggered. They were more inspired. Inside, inside the museum, we have a big exhibition, a sort of living lab, where we're showing a real piece of space waste from the Hubble telescope that an astronaut captured. This is really cool. And the second phase is that we say, let's team up with the space experts to capture. Nobody really knows why and how to capture it. We think of a net or a laser or an arm. So we're trying to figure out with the scientists how to capture it. But also, we need to upcycle it. It's like when you were a boy or girl. Eh? You don't want to clean up your room. You want to have an ice cream and watch television. Eh? So <laughs> cleaning up is not fun. So if we capture it, eh? if we capture this 8.1 million kilo of space waste, what can we do with it? Eh? What if it's like an ingredient, a Lego block? So can we use it to 3D print houses on the moon? Why not? Or if we attract it with a net to the Earth, it hits the Earth atmosphere and it starts to burn. Ah, that's interesting. So waste is light. Can we create artificial falling stars as a replacement for fireworks at New Year's Eve? Something like this. So we're pushing very hard for Dubai, Dubai 2020, or also in Europe, to clean up space and make these artificial falling stars as a replacement for polluting fireworks. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I gave you a little bit of an idea how we can combine very practical elements into very poetic. I think we should redefine our perspective of what a city can be. And I'm looking forward to see how Milan and how Italy will evolve in the coming years and combine this very beautiful tradition with very futuristic thinking. Thank you so much. Yes.